Disposable cameras are fun, although it does seem wasteful and you don't ever get to see your pictures. Erin Hannon is sweet, unassuming, and eager to please. Daryl, meet Bear. Oh. Although she doesn't join the office until its fifth season, she quickly becomes a central member of the family, thanks to her easy likability and relentlessly cheery attitude. Fun! But driving all that sweetness and positivity is Aaron's chronically low self-esteem. Do they not like me, though? Aaron's lack of self-confidence has some of the downsides we might expect, like creating emotional instability and leading her into unhealthy relationships. Gabe was a great guy with so many wonderful qualities, but it was a challenge being touched by him. But it also draws people to her. Genuine friends and mentors who are attracted by her vulnerability and openness. Apoplexy is what I will have. Apoplexy. Yes. Got it. Oh, Oscar. Here's our take on how Aaron's story tells us something surprising about how embracing our weaknesses lets us harness them into strengths, and why Aaron's low self-esteem eventually takes her higher than she ever expected. Thank you! Thank you! This is the first award I've ever won in my entire life. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. The Take is now on Snapchat. Scan our Snap code or search The Take on Snapchat to subscribe to our show and never miss an episode. Cute sweater. Oh, thanks. Your shoes match. The bad at small talk. Erin's negative self image was formed by her difficult childhood. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. Between the foster homes and the orphanage, I had lice 22 times. Without a family to protect and nurture her, she became used to feeling alone and untethered. Growing up in an orphanage, you have to fight other kids for everything. Snacks, pillows, parents. Erin exhibits several of the negative signs of low self-esteem identified by sociologist Morris Rosenberg, such as sensitivity to criticism. Erin is hurt by even the smallest of negative comments. How would you rate me as a receptionist on a scale of one to three? Um, two? It's like the second to last thing I wanted to hear. She also suffers from social withdrawal, avoiding conflicts and fleeing difficult emotional situations. In the foster home, my hair was my room. She shows hostility whenever she feels threatened and has a fierce competitive streak that sometimes takes over her personality. Eat it, piggy! Eat it! Oi, 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 oi! We still gotta work together so we should keep it civil. <gasps> But somehow, Erin's low self-esteem actually contributes to a lot of the more likable things about her. Her eagerness to please others makes her an exceptionally enthusiastic team player. Planking is one of those things where, hey, you either get it or you don't. <laughs> and I don't, but I am so excited to be a part of it. Erin's self-deprecation naturally leads her to lift up everyone else around her. Send completed. You are the best in the biz, I can't deny. <laughs> and her deep desire to seek the love she feels is missing in her life makes her genuinely open to connections and supportive of others. Happy, 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 happy. <laughs> we can get some chicken fights going in the pool. Right, that's just, that's really perfect. Thank you, yes. In some ways, Erin's instincts to be self-effacing and demure reflect ongoing problems in our expectations of women in the workplace. I'm not sure I've earned the right to make announcements yet. As researchers have found, confident women are often perceived as less likable, and they're often met with backlash for failing to appear appropriately modest. You can use your clothing to send a message about your ambitions by wearing clothes that reflect what you aspire to be. And apparently, judging from her outfit, Jan aspires to be a whore. Far from challenging these unfair standards, Erin goes to the opposite extreme. She eagerly sets aside her own individual needs for the good of the company. She always shows unconditional loyalty to her superiors. Where's Stanley? He's in the bathroom. W will you run into the bathroom and tell him to eat it? Of course. And a complete deference to the rules, no matter how trivial. I'll leave it up here so everyone can enjoy it. Oh, um, let me just check with Michael. I think it'll be okay. <laughs> I think it will too, but I'll just check with him. These are not positive professional traits to be emulated by women who want to advance in their workplace. But ultimately, that's not what Erin wants. My last job was at a Taco Bell Express, but then it became a full Taco Bell and 
I don't know, I, I couldn't keep up. What Erin craves more than anything is a home. The sense of stability she was denied as a child. You were adopted. I wish. I don't know what it was. Not lovable, maybe. <laughs> and by being a source of unconditional love and support to the rest of her co-workers, Erin creates that family she's been seeking all along. Look, my invoices have triple carbons. That means three layers. Erin, look at these shiny earrings. They're yours, and I'll give them back to you if you come to lunch. Gabe, just go and have fun with Erin, but not too much fun. That girl's gonna turn my hair gray. Until she joins Dunder Mifflin, the closest thing Erin has to a family is a former foster brother, with whom she seems to have a somewhat inappropriate relationship. Hey, my feet aren't smelly. They smell like roses. <laughs> the lack of any parental figure has trapped Erin in a sort of perpetual adolescence, unable to see herself as an adult or behave like one. I heard that you wanted to make the party more adult. This game is called Pecker Poker. Oh, yeah. It's the game of cards that gets you hard. But the silver lining of Erin's childish vulnerability is that it announces to people that she's in need of caring and genuine adult bonds. As life coach Dana Zarcone has pointed out, people with low self-esteem often make others want to take care of them. Erin is more or less the baby of the office, and she naturally attracts surrogate mothers, including Phyllis, who briefly thinks Erin might even be the child she once gave away. If my daughter were asking me, Yes. <laughs> Aaron also gives Nellie the opportunity to explore the maternal side that makes Nellie want to adopt a child of her own. I wish I could just wave a magic wand and make you a parentless five-year-old again. I would snap you up. Taking care of Aaron doesn't just benefit Aaron. It allows her co-workers to discover new sides of themselves. And nowhere is this more apparent than in Aaron's relationship with Michael. As a narcissist with a big personality, It is wonderful to be the center of attention. Michael initially finds Erin's meekness and low self-esteem off-putting. She's kind of a rube. But Erin's vulnerability allows Michael to finally play the father he's always seen himself as. You listen to me, you are not to tell me what to as do. As long as you are living under this roof, you are going to do what I say. While this relationship is obviously good for Erin, it's arguably even better for Michael fostering his own growth from a needy man-child into a more capable, more generous mentor and friend. You don't need a mom because you have my number and you can call me anytime. Erin's low self-esteem also leads directly to one of her most sisterly friendships. Kelly, yo, game on. Got it. In Erin, Kelly finds a loyal sidekick. You look like J-Lo. Someone who will pander to her constant need for attention and validation. When this blows up, I'll probably go solo like Beyonce did. You are so talented. Before Aaron arrived, it was Kelly who was often treated as the child of the office. But Aaron gives Kelly the chance to play the cool big sister, sometimes bossing Aaron around. People are gonna flip out when they hear our new song and they hear our group's new name. Oh, did we come up with a new name? We did. Subtle sexuality. But also looking out for her. I just want you to know that I will be mean to Jessica if you want me to be. It's another relationship that proves mutually beneficial, giving both of them camaraderie and a greater sense of confidence. Cafe Disco, we're like crappy Disco. You're bad. I've got a boy. The idea of finding your work family is one that The Office interprets almost literally. Daddy's here, and Daddy is gonna take care of you. Please don't refer to yourself as our daddy. It's also a concept that some employers can misuse or exaggerate to justify exploiting their workers. But research does confirm that having a familial relationship with coworkers boosts productivity and feelings of well-being in the workplace. As the needy baby of the Dunder Mifflin family, Erin provides a necessary center to that family, someone for the others to protect and nurture, bringing them all closer together and making them better people in the process. Look, it's, it's all right, it really it isn't your fault. With her new family looking out for her, Erin is eventually able to build on herself. You shouldn't rush into this at all. And you know why? Because you are beautiful and you are fun and you are smart. And when the right guy comes along, you'll know it. You're the nicest person I've ever met.
Of course, there are significant downsides and dangers to Aaron's low self-esteem. When it comes to romance, Aaron's neediness, her eagerness to please, and her limited life experience all put her at a notable disadvantage. The winner gets to pick the movie we watch. So far, I've seen The Shining, Rosemary's Baby, The Ring. Not really my thing. Erin stays where she feels safe, which causes her to limit her options and rush into relationships with partners she's not totally sure about. Erin doesn't even like sex. Remember, you said it feels like getting tackled by a skeleton. According to NACAC Youth Engagement Coordinator Kayla Van Dyke, this is typical behavior for former foster children with a feeling of having been abandoned or the perceived absence of love and value from their biological family, who will typically manifest these insecurities in a fervent drive to be affirmed and find stability through romantic partnerships. Gabe takes advantage of Aaron's vulnerability, using his power to manipulate her. Thank God he's my boss, because I would not have said yes to a first date if I didn't have to. Throughout their relationship, Gabe steamrolls over Aaron and completely ignores her wants. I know how much you want to watch Wally. -E. Yes. So, I got us a compromise. This movie's called Hardware. And although Aaron is unhappy with Gabe, even repulsed by him. Can, <laughs> can you stop talking? Because every word out of your mouth is like the squawk of an ugly pelican. For a long time, her low self-esteem causes her to keep her feelings to herself rather than confront him. I can't just dump him, Pam. I'm not like you. I can't be mean. It's only with the help of her work family that Erin is finally confident enough to assert herself. And even then, she looks to someone else to validate her own feelings. We should break up. I just, I cringe when you talk. I have to be honest. Right? Right, Pam. It takes Erin far longer to realize that Andy isn't right for her either. At first, the two do seem well-matched. Whoa, traffic jam. Uh-oh, <laughs> traffic jam on Route 3. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. But it's evident almost immediately that what Andy is most attracted to is Aaron's meekness and her almost virginal wholesomeness. Not only is Aaron really sweet and cute, she smells like my mom. Andy doesn't like to see this idealized image spoiled, even when Aaron's only pretending. Hey, big boy. Do you like it when you do that? Meanwhile, Andy uses that trusting nature against Aaron, keeping her in the dark about what he prefers not to share about himself. I know about Angela. I know that you were engaged to her and that you were sleeping with her. Their on-again, off-again relationship does see Aaron make some strides toward self-actualization. Andy, you broke my heart. Do you know what it feels like to be constantly rejected by you? I think at some point in my head it just sort of clicked that we're not meant to be. But Aaron still comes back to Andy whenever he decides to love her, and she remains committed to him, even as she increasingly realizes she doesn't love him. But when you're with someone, you put up with the stuff that makes you lose respect for them. And that is love. Ultimately, it takes Andy actually abandoning her, just like the family she never knew, before Aaron can finally walk away. We're breaking up. And just so you know, I was worried that you were dead. While Andy brazenly preys on Aaron's low self-esteem in order to put his own happiness first. I know you may not be feeling love for me right now, but if you fake it, I won't be able to tell the difference. So I'll feel good. Starting a relationship with Pete represents a major breakthrough for Aaron, where she finally accepts that she deserves to be happy. I'm sorry. Oh, you don't have to apologize. I just, I just want you to be happy. With Pete, Erin is finally fully herself, even dropping her tendency to sugarcoat. He, uh, uh, he flipped a table one time when he was drunk. He sounds like an idiot. Pete makes Erin feel cared for, validated, and safe. Oh no, come here. <laughs> hey, hey, come on. <laughs> The show even posits Aaron and Pete as the next generation of its most iconic couple. Wow, maybe Pete is the new Jim. Like Pam at the beginning of the show, Aaron has also been settling for less out of a resigned acceptance that she'll never do any better, until she finds her own Jim, who finally helps her see her own worth. You two are geniuses, and I am a genius putting you two together. In the Office's series finale, Erin is reunited at last with the parents she spent her whole life searching for. But by then, it almost doesn't matter. She's already found a family, one who raised Erin from being the baby of the office 
to a well-adjusted, confident woman. Can everyone please stop speaking for me? Aaron's story arc shows us that, counterintuitively, there can be a kind of hidden power in accepting and owning our low self-esteem. While we may think that people will like us only when we are perfectly put together, when we are already complete, Sometimes it's our vulnerabilities, our neediness, and our openness about those needs that can attract people to us. Making space for what we don't yet have in our lives allows us to form the kinds of deep bonds that will, eventually, empower us to become our very best selves. I'm still Andy's girlfriend. No. But you can leave your arm. Sometimes all you need is the right people to believe in you, until finally, you do too. How do you like me now? I hope as a friend. This is The Take. What do you want our take on next?